All right, good morning, Washington Church. Will you guys stand and join us in the call to worship? How great is our God. How awesome are your deeds. Lord, you are gracious and compassionate. You are my rock, my shield, and my fortress. Therefore, we will sing your praises and speak of your goodness. Jesus, you are worthy of all worship and praise. Reveal yourself to us.
find this space a place to dwell, that we would submit ourselves to you, that we would long to hear from you and long to follow you, long to meet with you in this space. So Holy Spirit, come and have your way in this space. Just come and have your way in our hearts and our lives. Amen. Hey, at this time, I'm going to invite you to greet others around you, and kids can come on forward for the kids' message. Well, that was the easy part. One of my earliest memories, and I think about it almost every time I roll up a sleeping bag, is when I went camping when I was about four years a kid. How old are you? Five? I was older than that. That's embarrassing. Wait. How old are you? I can't do math that fast. Eight? Okay. Is there anybody that's six? Is there any six-year-olds? Is this going to work, or do I need to switch? It's going from bad to worse. Where? Right here. Henry's six? If you're six, raise your hand. OK. When I was six, I had a not-so-pleasant experience camping. Well, it was. Is this thing on? OK. Whoa, that's so much better. But now I'm going to have to have some help, because my hand is occupied. OK, enough of that. Where was I? Six. Six. I went camping. It was a great week. Father-son camping. We did all the things. It was the last day. We had one more activity. But before we did the activity, we had to clean our cabins, which meant the sleeping bag had to be rolled up. And for some reason, my dad decided that that was a time I had to learn how to roll up my own sleeping bag. And so there I was, six, staring down the bag, tears in my eyes, crying, because I did not want to roll up the sleeping bag. I wanted to go play and do the last activity. You can understand the pressure. It's the last activity, and then we go home, and the world comes to an end. That's it. No more camp. I'm never going to go camping again, right? Can you feel the pressure? Anybody else felt that? I don't believe you. There, see, she's, tr she's honest. She's with me. Now, how many of you think that my dad just said, here's the bag, good luck? Do you think my dad did that? <laughs> what was your dad like? <laughs> Actually, it was not my first dance with a sleeping bag. My dad had showed me how to do it. I just didn't want to do it. History has a way of repeating myself. I'm going to embarrass my son. Jamie, can I embarrass you? Please. Okay. Well, in my household, there may or may not have been another little boy who needed to put away his sleeping bag, and he was not too happy about it either. I need this. Can I have that, please? And he had not done it ow, before. Can you, can you be a volunteer? Thank you. So... I said to the boy, you know, I've done it for you, and you've watched. And uh, I've mostly done it while you helped, but now it's time for you to do it while I help, right? And he was still not very happy about it. But guess what? 
Did you eventually get the sleeping bag put away? You guess? Yes, you definitely did. And how happy were you when it was finished, right? Well, he was pretty happy. I was happy too. I was delighting in the fact that my son can now put a sleeping bag away by himself. Isn't that amazing? And there were some times, do you guys see, this is a stuff bag. Has anybody ever done this before? Raise your hands if you've done this. Okay, so you know what I mean. You kind of got to hold the bag, right? And then you grab the sleeping bag and you start just cramming it in there, right? But the first little bit can be kind of hard. So what I did was I used my hand and I, I helped hold it like this and that makes it easier. And now you've got, and you just start stuffing away. Look at them go. Isn't this great? And if, if my wireless microphone situation were working out, it looked something like this. Is Jamie doing this by himself? Yeah. You know, uh, sometimes we have to do things in life that are really hard. Have you guys ever had some hard things you have to do? And, uh, kiddos, find my eyeballs real quick. As you make space to be quiet and be still and listen to the still small voice of God, God's going to start asking you to do some things that you may be like, what? Are you for real? That sounds really hard. I don't know if I can do that. And so sometimes when we're in those places where why we either have something hard we have to do or God is asking us to take a step of faith, we might pray something like, God, will you just make the sleeping bag go in the bag, please? And then we get all upset when it doesn't do it. Because, <laughs> you know, God has this thing that he does. If you start reading the scriptures and all the stories in there, he asks little peons to do silly things. Can you guys think of a story where a little young person was asked to do something really, really big? Yes. Classic tale when David fought Goliath. David was, uh, I don't think he was bat mitzvahed yet, so he was less than 12. Do we have any 10-year-olds in here? Okay, so kid your age, watching sheep, went to kill a giant. How about that? Sound good? So God's trademark move, you guys know what my trademark move is? Do you have friends that have a trademark move, something they just do all the time, like you're really good at it? I'm good at burping loudly on microphones. It's one of my favorite things to do. I won't do it today, but I have done it in the past. It's fun. God's trademark move is to use small people to do big things. Loves it. Um, the Apostle Paul writes, God said to him, my power is made perfect in your weakness. Because when, when God does something, when a big, strong dude picks up a small bicycle, right? If I pick up my son's bicycle with one hand, who cares? I can do that. When Jamie does something silly, it's like, wow, <laughs> how did he do that, right? God is glorified in that. So, like, if you have a friend at school or a neighbor down the street who looks different from you or is difficult or an angry person or somebody who's mean and God's asking you to show them the love of Jesus and you're like, how am I possibly going to do that? Just remember that God can do anything through you if you're willing to take a step of faith, rely on him. And he's not going to ask you to put the sleeping bag in by yourself. He'll help you. Okay? All right. Let's pray about that, will you? If you need to close your eyes to help yourself focus a little bit, please do that. God, you have all power. You hold the keys to all kingdoms. All things are yours. I don't know why you ask us to do things, but it is. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know why. I know why. It's for your glory, and we thank you for that. Thank you for using us. God, I ask that you would help each one of these little ones to remember that there's, there's work for them to do for your kingdom. That you can use them to do mighty things, even as little kiddos. Help them to trust in you and to know that they won't have to do the sleeping bag alone in life. 
And all God's children said, It's really quiet in here today. <clears throat> Is everyone really just asleep, or are we just waiting for God to do big things, or what? I don't know. Let's, let's get loud. I don't know. It's really quiet. Let's give a shout out. I am used to, it's just really subdued in here today, which is all right. I'll bring, I'll bring some energy um, to the stage. Um, I am so glad you're here. Uh, I'm so glad you're here with us to worship our living God, uh, a God who helps us put our sleeping bag in, in the bag. Um, thank goodness we're not doing it alone. Um, we're so grateful to serve a God who wants to use us and walks with us as he does it. What, a, what um, an amazing journey we get to go on with God. Um, it's really cool. So, and I'm so glad to do it with you. So, um, we're so glad you're here. Thanks for being online if you're online this morning. Um, a few announcements here. Um, our connection cards, if you guys have those, if you are new, fill that out. If you are not new, you can fill it out. You can share your life with us through this way. You can also always call or email the office or just tell one of us on staff. But if you have any information you want to share with us, you can use a connection card for that. Um, if you would like to give to Washington Church, you can do that online. There's a QR code here. You can go on our website. Um, there are black boxes that you can put an offering in on your way out if you would like. Um, we are so grateful for your generosity. Um, and a couple other things that we want to share. One, um, we are having next week, um, Guy Cameron, who I don't think is here today. Is Guy here? He's not here this morning. Um, Guy Cameron was asked, um, well, he got invited to go to Zambia. Um, and he will be going to Zambia this summer. Uh, and one of the projects that he will be working on or helping with is building a well um, over there uh, for the people in the community. And he will be sharing a little bit about that next week. Uh, but he is also going to be putting on a fundraiser next week, right after church downstairs, a lunch fundraiser to help raise money, support for this project that he is helping with. Um, so we just wanted to make sure you are aware of that. If you have any questions about it, Guy is the best person to reach out to to talk to about what he'll be doing. Um, but that will be happening right after church next week, downstairs in the fellowship hall. So if you'd like to learn more about it, you can certainly reach out to the office. We'll get you in touch with Guy. Um, but you can also come to that fundraiser, learn more about it. And if it's something you'd like to give towards, you're very welcome to do that um, and help build a well for a community um, that desperately needs it. Um, so we wanted to mention that. That's happening next week. Um, also help happening next month, which is only like a week or so away. July is not that far away. Um, you guys may have either seen an email if you're a parent. You have heard Jimmy talk a little bit about it last week. But we will have some changes in our child care this summer. Um, and so parents got an email this week, and we wanted to follow up with the rest of you guys so you knew what was going on. But we have felt as a staff and even as a church body for a while to integrate more of our family worship. And you guys have seen that happen every third Sunday for the past year or so. We've had our family worship. And actually it was sweet to see Micah Basket. He was still running around like it was family worship Sunday. I loved it. He was just doing laps like he normally does, worship in the Lord. Um, but we started to integrate that as a way to encourage our, our families to worship together and to help to understand it's not just here at, at church, but as you go home to worship together. And so as we do more of that, we wanted to give an opportunity for more of that to happen. And so, and, and other reasons too, we want to give our sweet volunteers a break. Um, we have 40 plus volunteers probably in our kids ministry, and we want to give you guys a much needed uh, a summer break. Uh, and so starting in July, July through the first week of August, we will not have any child care um, birth, so green room, uh, on up through fifth grade. Um, to encourage you, one, to do some worship together here, uh, give our kids a give our child care a break, and also it gives us time, Jimmy mentioned this last week, but to do some updates in some of our rooms, downstairs and even upstairs. So we want to do some updates in some of the rooms. So you'll see that starting July 7th, that's the first Sunday in July, um, your kids will be worshiping with you. Now we know that's a challenge, so in the email as a parent, I hope you saw that we are creating, we're in the process of creating a space up in the balcony for a family worship space so that you can 
still be in here, but have some things for your littles to, to keep them occupied. So we're going to have a family worship space and leave a couple of rooms available for you as a parent to go to if you need to have that. Um, but you'll hear more about it, but we wanted to make sure that the whole congregation knew what was going on, um, and so it wasn't a surprise. Uh, and we just feel like Although it can be a challenge, man, the benefits of having our people worship together and our families worship together, what a beautiful thing. And so um, I hope that you'll be praying right alongside with us as staff that this is just a, a, an amazing growth in our time as a family together. Um, so that's happening starting in July, our, the changes in child care. And then this week, and I meant to bring a prop and I got distracted, imagine that. Um, but this week is Vacation Bible School. Yeah, come on, it's Vacation Bible School. I don't know if you've ever been to VBS, but we need a little bit more energy. VBS is awesome. Um, it's happening Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday here in the church building. And um, we have kids coming. We have, I'm not kidding, probably like 35 adults helping. I don't know. I have an amazing amount of volunteers helping with VBS, which is awesome. Um, but it's coming up Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, if you have not signed your kid up, it is not too late. If you have a neighbor you want to ask, it is not too late. If you have a friend on the street or if you have a family member, it is not too late to sign them up. Um, four years old up through finishing fifth grade, um, we would love, love, love to have every kid we can here um, at VBS this week. And we will be learning about diving into friendship with God um, all throughout the week. And so we are super excited about it. But I do need some help. So a couple ways that you can help. There was an email that went out on Friday if you have have um, some donation supplies. Look back in that email. Actually, I think it's in the bulletin as well. I think I had Jenny put it in there. So we have some things that we could use help with donating um, or purchasing for us, but we also need help decorating. That's happening today. So whether you're coming to VBS or not and you think, I just want to help in some way, we're decorating from 2.30 to 5.30 here today, um, doing as much as we can. So if you want to come for any amount of that time, we'd love to have you help us get this place decorated for VBS. Um, we also would love your prayers. Please, please, please pray um, for our kids and our staff and our volunteers um, that this week would be filled with the Holy Spirit and that God would just speak mightily to our kids um, and they would hear his voice. Um, what an amazing way um, for our kids to learn more about how much God loves them and how much he is with them and cares for them. So um, if you have any questions about Vacation Bible School, please come see me. But if you can help today, we'd love it. Um, we're going to do some decorations. And if you can pray for us, that's great. Um, and lastly, if you need prayer, <laughs> I know Bridget usually says this, but I'm going to do it. Um, if you need prayer this morning, if you just want to sit with someone, um, you're quiet because something's going on, or you're quiet because God is speaking mightily to you and you want to share it with someone, um, our prayer team is available. Just grab the person next to you even. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if they have a yellow lanyard on or not. I mean, they're very willing to pray, but to talk to your neighbor. Um, reach out and just grab someone's hand. Um, speak to the Lord today and let him do what he does um, and just infiltrate um, your spirit and um, let's worship God. All right, let's stand and continue worshiping together.
John chapter 12, when Jesus is talking to his disciples about uh, his death, and he says, and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. And I always thought that meant like when Jesus is glorified that he will uh, draw men to himself. But that is Jesus talking about himself and when he is lifted on the cross for all men to see. And when he is lifted up on the cross, when his, his death and his burial and his resurrection is lifted up, then he will draw all men to himself. And so as we sing this song, I just want to sing that one more time just about his crucifixion, his death for us, and that he was raised from the earth so that he could draw all men to himself. And all the other things can pass away, but when we sing about Jesus and him crucified, we sing the reality of the gospel, we sing the truth of who Jesus is, and he will draw all men to himself as we sing about his death his burial and his resurrection. So let's just sing this part that death couldn't hold you down. And death, it couldn't hold you down. Hell, it couldn't steal your crown. There's a resurrection power in your name, in your name. And let all the earth cry out, lift up a whole Jesus, we thank you. That upon your death that you draw, that you drew all men into yourself. So Father, may your, your death and your resurrection be our anthem. May we live our lives never forgetting the price that you paid for us the way that you chose to draw us to yourself. Jesus, we honor you. We honor you for how you love us. So Father, even as we sing this song, about your death, would you start drawing men? Would you start preparing hearts? 
to come to know you as Lord, to come to know you as Savior, to come to know you as friend. Jesus, be magnified in this place. Be glorified in this place. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good to uh, be with you this morning. Uh, I get to introduce our, our speaker this morning, which I'm excited about, as we continue this journey through um, looking at the book of Genesis and God encounters, or encounters with God, to kind of learn. And we're moving from the garden, which we spent two weeks on, and we're moving forward into the, the story of Noah, um, which is a powerful and profound story. But uh, Mike is going to share with us this morning. Mike's been with us here at Washington for several years now, and, and uh, he's um, he, he has a de MDiv degree, the same degree I have. It's kind of the standard pastor's degree or, or the old school pastor degree um, from a seminary in Phoenix. And he's done ministry for over a decade, and, and it's been great to get to know him. But one of the things I love uh, about Mike is he's curious, and he wants to learn, and he's willing to take risks and put himself in places that May, may, he may not know everything or be fully comfortable in, but um, just I've gotten to see him grow and, and deepen in his walk with the Lord. Or, and since the time he's been here, it's been awesome to get to know his wife and his, his beautiful daughter. So would you join me in welcoming Mike up to uh, teach us? Thanks, bro. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, guys, I'm so excited to be here. And uh, we get to teach, I, it, it's kind of amazing. I've never uh, spoken on Noah before in my whole life, which is just wild, but it's like such a common story that I think a lot of us are going to be familiar with. And so it was fun for me to kind of get to do a little bit of a deep dive into some of the stuff and the details of Noah's story that I think a lot of times uh, we can cruise over when we're reading the, like, the storybook version of it. So we're going to look a little bit more in depth to that today. Um, and because this is, uh, you know, we only have so much time and Noah's story is like four chapters, we're not going to cover all of Noah's story. But what we're, where we're going to be sitting today is Genesis chapter 6. Um, we're going to be looking at like Noah's uh, tasks that God give to him and kind of the preparation part of the, the Noah and the ark journey, okay? And we're going to be looking specifically at the, the element of Noah's faithfulness as he walks through and, and, and takes on the task that God has assigned to him. And so open up to Genesis 6 if you're doing that. Um, and as we jump in, I do want to kind of ask the question, what was going on leading up to Noah and the ark? Because the reality is, is that it's kind of an interesting story, right? We see God create the heavens and the earth, and it was all good. And that starts off really great, right? Perfect, 10 out of 10. And then what happens after that? How's, how's the tone uh, look after that for the next little bit? Anybody know? Not so great, right? It starts off at a high point, and then it just like tanks, right? Adam and Eve betray God by eating of the tree of the knowledge of the fruit and, uh, sorry, good and evil, sorry. And then we see uh, they get kicked out, they get banished. Um, from paradise, and then they have sons, Cain and Abel, and that doesn't go so great either, because Cain gets jealous of Abel and ends up killing him and taking his life, uh, and then Cain gets cursed, and then we have like this narrative account of like all the generations that took place, and the time that this would have taken between uh, Adam's uh, creation and the time when Noah is building the ark would have been around 1,600 years right? So this is actually quite a long time that it took place between these couple chapters here because people lived for a long time and there was these generations that passed. And so a lot of, a lot of time happened in just a, like one chapter of the Bible that I think sometimes we miss out on appreciating. And so we're going to jump in. Um, but before I do, I think we're going to realize that 1,600 years is plenty of time for things to take an even continual um, change for the worst in terms of how humanity is doing. And as we read this, we're going to realize that there was a, it was a pretty dark environment by the time Noah is, is living his life, and there's a lot of evil taking place. And so let's read Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. I'm going to be reading out of the CSB, which I, I really like is a good, uh, pretty close to accurate translation that also helps um, you know, do some conversions and things, make it a little easier to read. But we'll read uh, the first verse together. It says, when the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of human mind was nothing but evil all the time. So we're just going to stop mid-sentence. But I just want to highlight that phrase that the inclination of human mind was nothing but evil all the time. That's a pretty extreme statement. In fact, the Lexham English Bible, which is a very literal translation, says it this way. He says, they say that uh, their uh, thoughts and their actions were always only evil. 
That's about as strong of a way you could say that as you possibly could. And what we learn from this section is that basically it's like humanity has said, you know what, God, we don't need you. We're done with you. Our backs are fully turned. These guys are just wanting nothing to do with God. And we see that again in verses 11, uh, I'm sorry, verses 6 through 8. Uh, It says, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and he was deeply grieved. Then the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I created off the face of the earth, together with the animals, creatures that crawl, and the birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. Noah, however, found favor with God. We're going to talk more about Noah in a second, but I want to read 11 through 13. It says, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with wickedness. God saw how corrupt the earth was, for every creature had corrupted its way on the earth. When God said to Noah, um, then God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to every creature, for the earth is filled with wickedness because of them. Therefore, I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. And you guys, this is like a really sad and heavy moment, right? This is not something that we can just breeze by because the reality is, is that this was, this was hard, right? And this was hard for God too. This was not something that like God, I think, entered into quickly. I think he literally sat for 1,600 years as man just keep on dismissing him and dismissing him, dismissing him, and finally got to this point where he's like, hey, we need a reset. We need a restart on this world. It was so dark to the point where the, of all humanity, it says Noah was like the one bright star in his family in this world. And so as, as much as some people, I think, struggle with this flood idea, the Bible says for the wages of sin is death, right? And so for justice, for God to be a just God, the punishment for people turning their backs and saying, I don't want anything to do with you, is death. And that's a, a tough thing for us to d- digest sometimes. But in here, I think we see that justice prevail, and God says, all right, we're going to do a restart, and we're going to get back on the right foot here, and we're going to use a man named Noah. So who's Noah? Let's read 9 through 10 together. It says, these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I love that description, right? Noah was a righteous man. Noah walked with God. Man, what a cool verse. Noah walked with God. He did life with him day by day. He said, we're going to do this together. And I don't know about you guys, but when I like, think about defining statements that I'd love to be true about my life, that's one. I would just love for somebody to say, Mike walked with God. You know, that just what a beautiful thing. And I love that. And Noah's name actually means rest, which is kind of interesting. And his father, Lamech, had actually said, you know what, I want Noah to be a person who brings rest to this world from the toils of this world. And so it's a little bit of foreshadowing of the work that God is going to do through Noah. I love how sometimes names have meaning in the Bible. Most, most always have that meaning. Um, and it says that he had three sons. Um, and in chapter 5, we didn't read that section, but it actually specifies that Noah was 500 years old when he started having his kids. Now, Aging, just so you guys highlight, was a little different back then because God hadn't decreased the life expectancy of humanity yet, but he was 500. Now, we know he was going to be 950 when he passed away, so a little bit spoiler alert, you know, flood's not going to take him out, um, but uh, he, did, uh, he did have his sons when he was 500, and so I think sometimes we think about Noah as like this really ancient dinosaur of a human um, at this time in the story, but also when he's, you know, he's kind of halfway, maybe he might be more middle-aged than we think he was. You know, I don't know exactly what he looked like, but I just, you know, he's kind of at his halfway point in his life at this point. All right, so let's get to the, the, some more of the core of the story here. And I actually want to read um, just kind of all in one shot here, kind of the instructions of what is God commanding Noah to do. All right, so we're going to kind of move through it quick. I know this is familiar for a lot of you guys, but I do want to kind of highlight it and read it to remind ourselves together. And so verse 14, we'll pick back up. God says to Noah, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it with pitch inside and outside. This is how you are to make it. The ark will be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. You are to make a roof, finishing the sides of the ark with 18 inches, uh, within 18 inches of the roof. You are to put a door in the side of the ark. Make it with lower, middle, and upper decks. Understand that I am bringing a flood, floodwaters on the earth to destroy every creature under heaven with the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark with your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives. You are also to bring into the ark two of the living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of everything, from the birds according to their kinds, from the livestock according to their kinds, and from the animals that crawl on the ground according to their kinds, will come to you, interesting phrase, will come to you, so that you can keep them alive. 
Take with you every kind of food that is eaten, gather it as food for you and for them. And we're going to walk through that chunk by chunk in a minute, but the three major kind of overview ideas that we see here is one is, hey, Noah, there's a flood coming, and it's going to destroy everything. In fact, it's going to cover the whole earth. And that's kind of hard for us to picture sometimes because this is like a supernatural event. This is something that hasn't ever happened and will never happen again, according to the Bible. Um, But basically, we learn that the water is going to be so high that you can't survive on the land anymore because the water levels are going to be so high. And so literally, the only way to survive this would be on a boat. And we also know, if you look at the chronology of how it's spelled out in there, that the time that Noah was going to have to enter that boat to the time that boat was going to be able to uh, settle on the ground, and then he's going to have a a space where they can exist, the time frame for that is 371 days. That's more than a year that there's going to be floodwaters on the earth if you do the the math on it. And so this was going to require somebody to build a giant boat known as the Ark. And this is going to require a whole lot of preparation to make this journey successful. And so Noah's job is to do that and to have a new chapter for humanity. So what are the instructions? We're getting a little technical here, but I think it's actually kind of funny how uh, in some ways vague the picture is that God, what God spells out for Noah. He says, make it with gopher wood. Now, gopher wood was a type of wood that we don't have today. Those trees don't exist, but it must have been a pretty strong wood um, back in Noah's day. Uh, it says, seal it with pitch inside and out. And so Noah would have had to like, make this paste of tree sap and some other materials to like, waterproof the boat so that things are not deteriorating, right? That's that one. Make it 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. All right, this is one that I think is one of the most common misconceptions about Noah, is that this boat was supposed to be giant, right? If we think about 450 feet, that's like one football field, 300 feet, plus another half of a football field, that's a pretty big boat, right? And I think sometimes we have some, some thoughts that that's uh, going to be smaller, and it's like 75 feet wide and like uh, five stories tall. You know, so this is, would have been a very large uh, vessel. And then he's supposed to put a roof on it, and he's supposed to put three decks, you know, for the three stories and all the rooms. And I, I think it's interesting because Noah is given these dimensions. God's like, hey, Noah, it's got to be real big. But then he's also like, not, not including a blueprint. He's not including diagrams. And what's also interesting is that no one has ever built a boat like this before, this point in history. And so Noah's got like, I don't know about me, uh, you guys, but I'd be feeling overwhelmed right now if I was Noah. And he just told me that. But at least he gives him something to start with. Um, and uh, this is going to be, uh, like I said, a really big job. And what I want to do, though, is before... Um, uh, we get to some application, which we are going to get to, I do want to stop and think through some of the questions that a lot of people ask about this Noah story. Because a lot of times, and I have a lot of friends that have heard this story and been like, man, this stuff just could not have happened, right? Like, this is crazy that this would have taken place. And so I want to address a couple misconceptions and explain a little bit about the process of what could have happened in this a lot of it's going to be um, research and, and kind of filling in the blanks, um, but I think we have some pretty good educated ideas about what this could have looked like. And so what would the process have been for Noah to build the ark? Uh, and again, I think one of the biggest issues that people have with this story is that some people think, you know, Noah was just like this really elderly man who was like very feeble, and he used like a, a stick and a rock because he was like a caveman, and he like built this ark. Has anybody, you feel like, ever heard or thought of this, this way before? I feel like there are people out there that have that perception. Um, the reality is, we already talked about his age, but we also know in Genesis 4.22 that there was this guy named Tubal Cain who was actually instructing people on how to build things with bronze and with iron um, already at this point in history, right? So there was people that had technology, they had materials, they had skill and knowledge of forging, um, and so there was definitely some more technology going on than I think some people realize at this time. Uh, Second, it never says that Noah built this ark all on his own. Like the Bible never specifies that this was a one-man construction crew. Uh, In the same way that the Bible says that Solomon built the temple, it says that Noah built the ark. Well, did Solomon build the temple all by himself? No, he had a whole bunch of helpers. And so I think for me, again, again, it could have been Noah and the angels, Noah and somebody. It seems extraordinarily likely that Noah had some help along the way. And I think that lines up with the scriptural understanding of what the phraseology meant. And so he would have likely had his family helping him. And he also would have likely, if I were guessing, um, may have even hired some people to help him, right? Because even if these people didn't believe in God, they might have been willing to show up to earn a paycheck to build a giant ark if that's what it meant to provide for their families. And so I'm guessing that there was some help along the way. So let's take a break from me teaching. Let's look at some pictures, guys. Um, Let's start with some pictures of what this ark might not have looked like, but I think a lot of us often think of the ark as. 
right? And so I think a lot of us in our brains, we have this, this one of these pictures of uh, this, this small boat. I love the middle one where it's like the boat's like three times the size of one elephant. And like that's apparently the size of the ark. Um, that'd be more manageable for Noah to build by himself, but it certainly wouldn't have matched what the Bible says. Um, and so I think these are like, I love that these pictures exist and I love that they're in our kids' books and things like that, but probably not the best picture of Noah's ark. Let's go to the next one. I think this might be a better picture of what this looked like. Now, the ark is still way too small, so that's what I don't like about this picture. But we see Noah here on the platform being like the project manager, helping to make sure everything gets done, and he's like responsible for it. We go to the next one. Um, and then we have, I think, some pictures that maybe better match the size of what this would have been, right? This would have been a monster, right? To match the description in the Bible, this thing would have been a very large construction project. Uh, you go to the next one. I also like this picture because you can kind of see the arcading bill in the background and then like the whole village coming together to like support it, to cook food, to like, you know, some of all the little background stuff you don't think about to make an arc happen. You have to like feed people and stuff like that. So I like seeing that kind of picture. Um, one more. Um, we see another big picture of the arc being constructed, constructed hypothetically. You can do one more. Um, and then this is a picture of the Ark exhibit. I've not been there, Ark Encounter. Uh, has anybody been to the Ark Encounter? Okay. I, I've heard some good things about it. I've not been there. Um, but uh, they built one that seemed to match the descriptions or, you know, uh, from the Bible. And so you can kind of see what it may have looked like. Again, we don't know for sure. Um, but that's just a picture of the size and scale. Uh, and so I just wanted you guys to have some, some context as we think about this. Uh, and the other thing I want to point out before I switch to the animals is that the reality is that this probably would have taken more than like a weekend to build. Is that safe to say? <laughs> yeah, okay. I think the fastest we could guess this would have taken like 10 years to construct. I think scholars have said the longest this might take would be 50 to 75 years to build this boat. And so this would have not been short. This would have been extraordinarily long and a huge task for people to go through. Um, second question, and then we're going to uh, mix it up a little bit, but I want to answer and talk about how did Noah manage all the animals? Uh, and I think the first question people ask was, well, how many animals were actually on the ark? And scientists have said, you know, I think we could have preserved the animal kingdom as we know it today if they had 1,400 different animal pairs on the ark, roughly. And who knows the exact number? Um, that's some speculation about that I think is kind of interesting. Um, and I think it's also important to know that they probably didn't bring full-size animals on, like all the adult elephants and giraffes. They might have had babies to come along or children uh, to help fit and squeeze into the ark to make it a little bit more manageable. So I thought that was kind of some interesting things as I was researching this. Um, and then the final thing I just want to point on uh, is just that I, the Bible says that uh, God brought the animals to Noah, right? A lot of times we think, at least for me, I'll, I'll confess, uh, that like Noah went and like wrangled up all the bears and like brought them on two by two, right? Has anybody thought that way before? Okay, maybe I'm the only one. Um, but the reality is it says that God brought the animals to Noah. And I really do think there's one more picture here of like the animals kind of showing up and Noah's just kind of like, all right, guys. Time to get on the boat. Um, and I don't know exactly what this would have looked like, but I, talking, going back to um, John's message for the kids, right? God showed up and helped make this whole thing happen too, right? God was a part of this story. And I think this was a big way that, um, that God showed up is to bring all the animals here through whatever supernatural means necessary. And so Noah um, had to prepare the ark for that 371 day journey. And uh, he did that. So now I want us to get creative, okay? Is anybody ready to get creative here? All right, I'm going to do a group exercise. And so you guys have some papers at the end of your pew, and I would love for you with the people around you to do this. Uh, pretend that God had given you the responsibility to build the ark and to prepare the things needed for the 371-day voyage. Work with groups around you and brainstorm some of the items on your to-do list that would have been important to accomplish to be successful in this gargantuan task that God had just assigned to you. So we don't know everything, but use your brains. I want you to put yourself in Noah's shoes. I mean, if you have some little ones, my daughter was spitting out some good answers at five. So, you know, let the little ones share too. Um, and so, yeah, we can do that for just a couple minutes and then we'll, we'll debrief, okay?
All right, wrap up your couple ideas that you have you're talking about. Surely that was not enough time to come up with an exhaustive list, okay? So I know that we, we probably just scratched the surface for something that would have been so big. Um, but I want to hear from a few of you guys just to share out some of the things on your to-do list. We don't have time to discuss them together, but if you just want to quickly say out loud, loudly, some of the things that you brainstormed, I'd love to hear from somebody who's bold enough to share some things. Anybody? Yep. Waste management. Waste management. <laughs> they didn't have porta potties back then. They didn't have, yeah, it was a whole different thing. So I love that, Corey. Anything else? What was on your guys' list? Yeah. Oh, light source. Yeah, how do you work at nighttime? How do you do that? Yeah, Jaina. Oh, washing their clothes. Yeah, what? All, I love how like, simple these things are. Yeah, what else? Keep on shouting them out. Food. Cooking food, preparing food. What else with food? Anybody else say anything about food? Fire, Fire cooked food? Is that what you said? Yeah. It, it, oh, this is good. She's getting deep here. So they had to provide for these animals for like a year. So they had, it, God said, you have to get all the food they're going to need for this journey. All the types of food known to man is what he says, right? So they would have needed a whole mountain of food. Yeah, what else? Right? Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Dealing with people, dealing with people who are um, shady, dealing with uh, the, the spirits of man and um, uh, conflict management, right? There's just like a whole lot of that. Yeah, a couple more. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, taking care of the animals. Yep, that's a big thing. Learning about what they need because they might not have known how to take care of a rhino. Who knows? Um, Millie said drinking water. They need to make sure they have a water supply. I love that. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Things are going to break. They need backups. Yeah. You, can, you don't have like trees to cut down when you're on the, the ark. You have to bring some spare stuff. This is so good. All right. Uh, okay. Last one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, the history. What in the world? That's a huge one. They would have needed that. You know, where, where we got these original accounts from. I love that. Okay, so I, thank you guys for participating in that. What I really wanted for us to do was to think about what it would have been like to be there and to think about what it would have been like to be in Noah's shoes, okay? And I think as we're doing do this, some observa two observations I had is, one, Noah would have needed to be like a logistics mastermind or like he would have needed help to be a logistics mastermind. But this was a giant task. And number or two is that for Noah to be faithful in God, faithful to God in completing this task, his strength and his character would have been tested in just about every way imaginable. Would have been tested in just about every way imaginable. I mean, think about how vast this was. When we read the Bible and when we teach our kids, oftentimes, at least for me, I don't understand the gravity of just how big this project was. You guys, this thing is like probably bigger than any of us have ever done in terms of one project in our entire lives, is what Noah had to do. And he would have been stretched in every way. I just kind of highlight a couple things. First of all, mentally, you know, this man would have had to draw blueprints. He would have had to run calculations, figure out how many support beams to put into, how to figure out where to put the elephants and so the rhinos apart from each other so they balanced out the weight on the boat. You know, like weird stuff that we wouldn't have thought about. So much calculations. He would have been physically tested um, because he was out in the sun. He was swinging hammers. He was forging nails. He was spreading pitch. He was dealing with dehydration. He was dealing with being 550 years old when he was doing this. And that was tough. Emotionally, he was tested so many times. Do you think Noah ever felt burnt out? I felt burnt out over less stuff than this, right? Like, just being honest. Like, I bet he dealt with that stuff. I mean, I don't know for sure, but it seems likely. He also had to deal with, like, ridicule, right? People probably were like, what is this Noah guy doing? He's on 40 years building a giant boat in the middle of this, like, you know, land area. Like, what is this guy thinking? Um, people make fun of people for wearing, like, weird shirts, let alone, like, building a giant ark for 40 years, right? Or 50 years or however long it took. Um, spiritually, he would have been tested with his faith. I think this would have been maybe the hardest one for him. What if I just imagined this all? Do you think that thought ever entered Noah's mind? What if there isn't even a flood coming and I did this? You know, you're 40 years in. Do you think that doubt sneaks in? Or maybe even bitterness towards God, thinking, man, couldn't God have given me like an easier task? Like, why do I have to be the guy who builds the ark, you know? I don't know what, what it was. Again, I'm just speculating. But this would have been testing his faith. 
And then lastly, uh, if some of the bigger buckets, I'm sure there's many more, would have tested his leadership. You know, he had to learn how to delegate well. He had to deal with conflict. He had to keep the team's morale up because, as I think John was pointing out, these are some broken people, right? And you had to go ahead and, and keep their spirits up. And he had to lead these people spiritually, right? Noah talked to God about this stuff, but he didn't talk to everybody. And so he had to, like, shepherd these people to work and to build with him and to, to prepare for this giant voyage. And so his faith had to lead their faith. And so I hope you guys are getting the sense of just how big this assignment was and how difficult it would have been for him to be faithful to God in completing it. But what I want to highlight right now is what I think is the single most important verse in this chapter and probably in this entire story, okay? So if you're tuned out a little bit, this is the time to turn back in because I think this next verse is going to be what I would say defines Noah as a hero of the faith. And I think it's the verse that has been, not haunting, but it is lingering in my mind for the last few weeks as I've been preparing this message. Are you guys ready for it? Genesis 6.22, after the to-do list, it says, And Noah did this. He did everything that God had commanded. You guys, Noah did it all. He did it all. He walked through it all with God. He finished the job. And I'm not saying that he didn't stumble along the way because there's like a 99.9% .9 chance that this man had some, some moments of hiccups where he felt burnt out, where his emotions got the best of him, etc. But at the end of the day, he got every critical part of this to-do list done for God to make sure that this took place. And I don't know about you guys, but I was just reading it, and I was thinking about this last night, and I was like, man, when I get to heaven and I see Noah, like, I want to give that man a hug and put, give him a pat on the back. I don't know if he's a hugger or not, but I'm going to give him a hug anyways. And I'm going to say, bro, you did it. You did the job. This was crazy. And you were faithful to God for decades and decades and decades, right? Like, that's crazy, Noah. How did you do that? Because the reality is, is that it would have been so easy to give up. Wouldn't have? Like you cut your board short for the 10,000th time to build that ark. Like some part of me would have just wanted to walk away. Be like, ah, I'm not cutting another board. I'm done. But he kept on walking with God and he was faithful. And so guess what, church? There's a truth I want to hit you with right now. And that is that I don't think that God put the story of Noah in the Bible just so that we could look back and say, wow, Noah was a faithful guy. I don't think that God put the story of Noah in the Bible just so that we could have a better understanding of history, which I think he did for both of those reasons too, just to be honest. But I think also that God put the story of Noah in the Bible because I think God wants us to see Noah's faithfulness and to strive to be more like God, uh, faithful to God like Noah in our own lives too. Because just like with Noah, God has invited each of us into a relationship with him and God has given each of us assignments for us to complete big assignments, assignments that should be life-defining in the same way that Noah's building the ark was life-defining for him, all right? I'm just going to uh, jostle your memory a little bit, okay? We're going to we'll just list off a few of things that Scripture says God has assigned to each of us. Number one, representing Christ to others, right? It's our job to be Christ with skin on to the people around us, with our character, with the way we love others, with the way that we are kind to others when it's difficult to be kind. So we have to ask, how are we, how are we doing with that assignment? Another one, sharing the good news about Jesus to other people, right? Telling people about Jesus Christ and that he, we can have a relationship with him. The Bible says that's something for us to do. What about discipling other believers? When people put their faith in Jesus, they need help to grow, and the Bible says that's our responsibility to help mentor and lead other people. What about using our unique God-given gifts and abilities to help build God's kingdom and his church, right? God has made each and every person in this room different, and he gave you skill sets so that you could use them to build his kingdom, just like Noah was building his ark, and you have your own assignments that God has put before you. And we have to ask, am I being faithful to God with my gifts and my abilities? That's one of our tasks. What about maintaining righteousness and purity? Ah, oh, this one's tough. Um, we live in a world where it is like so easy to drift towards what's normal, and yet God has called us to be holy temples before him and blameless. Are your actions and your thoughts aligned with God's heart and will? Abiding in Christ. We need to be walking with God daily just like Noah walked with God. That's his invitation to us to have time with him, to reflect with him, to pray throughout our days, those sorts of things. That's a part of abiding with Christ. And then a few ones, I think, relating to family that I think are going to hit home for a lot of us. They hit home with me. Spouses. We're supposed to love and serve each other. That's one of our assignments. And that's a tough assignment to do. I'll be the first one to say. Parents. We're supposed to love and disciple our children. Wow. What a big responsibility. Children. We're supposed to obey and honor our parents. Right? 
We all have roles and assignments that God has given us. And there's a million other things that could be on this list. But as I read the story of Noah, I just can't help but ask myself if I'm being faithful to God in the same way that Noah was faithful to God with his tasks and responsibility. Am I holding fast to following them? Could I say that Noah did all, or that Mike did all that God had commanded of me? And the honest truth is, today, is that I'm not. I don't prioritize evangelism as much as I should in my personal life. I don't always have godly character. I struggle sometimes with my family and loving them the way that I should. Um, I, the list goes on, you guys. And that's real. And one of the things that impressed, it was so impressive to me as I read Noah's story is that not only did he finish the job, but he didn't cut corners all the way, uh, along the way. Um, so I work in construction uh, at this point for the season of life, however that is. But one thing I know about construction is that it is incredibly easy to cut corners. Any other guys in construction going to give me an amen? <laughs> Just kidding. I don't know if that's an amen worthy. But it is... <laughs> Uh, that's probably not the right use of amen, but I do know it's true. I do know it's true, because when you're hot, you're sweating, you're doing difficult work, hours after hours, days after days, months after months, years after years, decades after decades, sometimes you just want to cut a corner, you know? Like, let's just get this done fast. But he didn't do that, because if he didn't, the boat wouldn't have been watertight. They wouldn't have had enough food. Humanity wouldn't have persisted. The animal kingdom would not have persisted. And so in all those major things, Noah did not cor cut corners, and so I think for us, as we're just reflecting on this, we need to ask ourselves, am I cutting corners in the responsibilities that God has assigned to me with our marriage, with our family, with our schooling, with our work, with our relationships, with our loved ones? That's a difficult question to ask. I've been struggling with it all week. And you guys, I'm not trying to paint this picture where, you know, Christians are always going to be perfect 100% of the time, and if you're not perfect 100% of the time, you need to, like, kick yourself and shame yourself. Like, that's not good either, right? The reality is that there's grace as we fail. Um, but at the same time, this is what God is calling us to strive for and to aim for, is walking with faithfulness to God. This week, I, I walked through the cemetery, and I visited my brother's grave, I spent some time thinking about life and death and thinking about how we can spend our time and what we can invest our time into. And there's a million options. That's the beauty of it, right? God makes each of us unique. And so none of our lives are going to look exactly the same. And that's a beautiful thing. But one thing that I thought about is that a life without regrets is a life where you walk in faithful obedience to God. When you fully share your entire life with him, when you don't hold back because you're afraid or because the task teams seems too hard. And I'm sure that if Noah was here today, he would say that as much as building the ark was brutally challenging, because it was, he would also say that it was incredibly rewarding too. Because you guys, nothing compares to living life with God. There's no greater joy. There's no greater satisfaction. There's no greater blessing than a life spent with him. He is an amazing Heavenly Father. And so as I invite our band back up to, to take us into worship, um, I want to just create a space for reflection. Um, because it's a cool story. And I think it's also an invitation for us. I think God wants us today to sit at his feet and just consider some of these questions that I just asked. Um, and so I, I just pray that we meet with him. I pray that we have humble hearts as we sit before him. Um, and if you feel led, I just, I just pray you just talk with the Lord transparently. Um, I'm, I'm going to pray for us now, um, but also our prayer team, if you guys are available. Um, if you want to share something, pray with something, we'll be available as we do our next song too. So let's just pray together and invite God in. God, we thank you so much for letting us be a part of your story. You didn't have to include Noah. You could have just snapped your fingers and, and taken care of this all yourself, but yet you have chosen to be faithful to humanity to walk with us, to invite us into this story, to give us a chance to serve you and to build your kingdom, to build your church, to be a part of that, God. Lord, I thank you that you are faithful to us. Lord, you know that I'm not always faithful to you. But Lord, you're right by my side. And that's true for each of us, God. And I thank you that you have not given up on us, that you persist with us, Lord. And I pray right now that as we meet with you, Lord, that you would just be speaking to us and just touching our hearts and just maybe poking at some things that might be good for us to hand over to you, areas that we need to grow in, 
ways that we can invite you in more and say, God, I want you to be a part of this part of my life. I want to be faithful to you in this part of my life because life is found with you, God, nowhere else. And so we just invite you in to do work, to lead and reign over us in our lives, God, to be in relationship with us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
And so God, I just pray that that's our prayer this week, Lord, that we would put our trust in you, that we would not be shaken, Lord. Lord, it's easy to get shaken in this world. I'll be the first one to say that, God. But Lord, we can find strength in you. We don't have to do this on our own. We have you as our foundation, God. And so we take that moment right now and we just say, yes, God, we will stand on you. We will walk with faithfulness to you, God, this week. Lord, thank you for being faithful to us. I just kept on thinking that in my head. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We love you. And we thank you for this time together. Amen. A couple things. Um, first of all, uh, one announcement that we just got from uh, Shannon was just that we're going to be getting ready for VBS right after service. And so if we could, we've had some guys or anybody who feels strong and wants to help us lift some pews, you can come up right here at the front or after service. We're going to be moving some pews around so our kids can play. Um, and then we just want to end by doing the same thing we do every week, which is our benediction. And so we're just going to say that together as our declaration as we leave our service today. We are a community of disciples of Jesus Christ embodying the power and giftings of the Holy Spirit, cultivating space for healing and living in and expanding God's kingdom on earth. All right, guys, go in peace. Amen.